There are unforgivable sins in the world that we all know are wrong and should never do. One of those, in fact, is putting pineapple on pizza. The other is buying altcoins without first assessing if they're even worthwhile for you to buy. Now, I know they're definitely two sins we all grew up with our parents ingraining in our minds, and yet most people, for some reason, still choose to ignore them. But not us. At least, not after this video. Anyway, today, guys, I'm going to show you why it's so important to never, ever put pineapple on pizza. Nah, you sent me the wrong script. To never buy an altcoin unless you've assessed certain parameters. Because the last thing you want to do is find out that you've bought an altcoin that is either bad or just simply will never achieve the goals you want by the end of the bull run. It's like, I don't know, trying to fit into clothing that you've outgrown. Stop trying to make it work. Oh, and by the way, before we get into the content, guys, I wanted to say a quick reminder, if you appreciate how much effort I put into the video, or if you just simply enjoy the content and wanted to say a big thank you, hit the like button and subscribe so you can achieve your crypto goals. Now, all joking aside, there are four extremely important things that you'll want to check before you buy any altcoin. And I really do mean any altcoin, no matter how many times you've heard your favorite influencer tell you how good they think it is. First of all, we're going to have to assess what's called the meme. Now, the meme isn't why what you think it is. Yes, it actually does have some correlation to what we all know as internet memes. These three on your screen are quite funny, but the main premise behind memes are they're easily understood and they're easily propagated. And what I mean by propagated is you can understand it, you find it funny and relatable, and then you want to pass it on to other people. That's the whole big part of being memetic or of being a meme, okay? Memes don't catch on, in this case, these types of memes, if they aren't funny, relatable, and of course, being able to easily be understood by other people as well. Inside jokes don't really kind of get passed on. And this can be the same and applied to cryptocurrencies as well, which is why you guys know from following the channel for a while, I push memes slash memetics a lot. Like this fundamentally is what, if you're going to do one thing or one bit of research in any altcoin, period, one thing, this is it, the meme. So it's the wow factor. Again, it's like you look at a project and you instantly go, wow, what the hell? I have to buy into this project right now. It's so different from its competition. It stands out. So Again, what's going to draw people into the altcoin? What is so different about it that makes people scream, I want this altcoin? I don't want to buy its competitors. This one sounds so cool. Now, whether it's vaporware, as in whether it's just a whole bunch of nothing, or whether it's real and actually working, is a different story. We're looking at some other metrics in a second here that will go and support the meme, but this fundamentally is the most important thing, okay? We are basically using psychology to understand what people find the most attractive in what's called a narrative or a niche. Simplicity often wins, and that's a big part of it. People tend to forget. If it's a complicated thing, I see time and time again on different websites, like, hey, our project does all these crazy technical crypto terminologies that not even I understand. It's not gonna propagate. It's not gonna send to other people. And again, remember, this is a speculation environment we're looking for in 2024 and 2025. No one's looking after things that are gonna actually be adopted. It's pure speculation, okay? We're all guessing what's gonna be good in the future. So it kind of works like this, okay? So layer one narratives might be a project. Now, one of the examples I have today is a near protocol. So you might have all the other layer ones, Hedera, uh, Mina, Casper, uh, you might have uh, Algorand over there, you might have Solana, Cardano, so on and so forth. But what makes Nia Protocol stick out like a sore thumb? Why do people want to buy it, okay? Not just buy it, then is it easily understood to then send to people? So this is like the four-step process I would tell you all to follow here. Again, by far, I don't give a single crap what anyone else in this industry says. This is the most important thing, personally speaking. One, what is the standards in the niche? You have to have a rough idea of what your projects competing with. Otherwise, you're not gonna know what sticks out, okay? You're not gonna know what's really wow, okay? That's a big part people tend to forget. That's why I always tell you guys to research areas of altcoins that you like. You know, if you like gaming, metaverse, if you like layer ones like I do, whatever it is, notice my portfolio is quite layer one heavy because I know a lot about them, right? That's my niche. What does your altcoin do that is so different? That's the wow factor. Is this amazing for a degen? It might be awesome for a developer who can understand gibberish, but DGENs can't. And can it be understood? Goes into play with can it be propagated, right? That's a big part of it. Can it be sent to other people? Again, understood by more. That's the four step process I would say you have to employ. Now, I've got Near Protocol and Pith Network as two examples. Near's layer one project for Web3. 
Pith is a price Oracle service built on Solana for many different chains. And I wanted to use these because one's a smart contract or at least fundamentally a smart contract. And one is a layer one project. So near protocol, and by the way, you can use websites for this, by the way, guys, like there's no problem with doing this. This is actually what most DGENs, which is where we make our money from, will look at, okay? Whether it's the home page or, you know, any sort of follow-up pages, do a little bit of research. This will take you 10 minutes, even as a beginner, to do this. What separates itself? Again, have a rough idea of the market, but in this case, you know, Near Protocol's whole MO, its whole identity now, is the blockchain operating system, which in of itself is very mimetic. It's very different and unique, even though it means the same sort of things, okay? If you scroll down, like what sticks out to you, okay? This is why it's, again, important to have an understanding of the narrative or the niche. JavaScript, so developers can come on and build with very identifiable and very, uh, I guess, old school program programming languages, or at least what you use in the real world quite a bit. Kind of like what is the big onboarding processes here? So I guess to summarize everything about Neo Protocol, it's looking to become the middleman between Web 2 and Web 3. It's got a whole bunch of services that is the boss, that enables developers and users to come on and very easily synchronize uh, from Web 2 to Web 3, whether it's, again, the end user or it's the developer. So that's their big sort of MO, and they didn't have that in the last bull run. They have it going into this bull run, which is a big bonus. Now, Pith Network, again, you kind of have to understand Oracle's in this case, mainly Chainlink to see what its competitor really is doing. But if we kind of scroll down, this right here will give you enough information to go, okay, its unique aspect here is one, it's built on Solana, two, it's fast, and three, it's highly connected, okay? It works on a you know, different type of Oracle service, first-party Oracles, which is different to Chainlink. It uses a different method to Chainlink as well, but we're trying to look in the eyes of the DGEN here, okay? They're not going to know what push and pull Oracles are. Some might, but for the majority, no. So 45 blockchains, 250 apps. 80 million updates a day, you know, 400 million data feeds. The list goes on. Again, you can probably find most of the information on most projects from the homepage. And it's simple. Go to other projects in that niche if you're not familiar and learn. This is simply how you do it. Now, again, it has to be a wow factor. If it just kind of blends in, if it just, if, if the meme, the unique aspect is kind of like, hey, we are fast and the rest aren't fast, so we're better. That ain't it. It's gotta be really something different. So the next thing we wanna do is assess the developers in the ecosystem, but we're assessing the developers on the underlying ecosystem and also the ecosystem it's attached to, if that makes sense. So I wanna give you two examples here, right? You have altcoin A over here and you have altcoin B, okay? Now, at the tech-wise, both the technologies here, let's say they're the exact same. 10,000 TPS, one second finality, infinitely scalable. Maybe their memes a little bit different. One's got, you know, higher security threshold. One's got EVM compatibility. They're both somewhat pretty, at, you know, even slight differences, whatever. But one's ecosystem has 300 developers and 150 dApps. And one has 30 developers and four dApps. What do you think is the one that's actually finding adoption? What do you think is the one that's somehow doing something right on the back end? Altcoin A, pretty simple. So we need to assess this. Now, it's important that we don't just assess the actual project itself. It's very important that we do assess the underlying infrastructure, okay? So if you've got a dApp like Pith over here, or if you have a project like Neo Protocol, whatever, work back to see if there is an underlying infrastructure. For Neo Protocol, Neo Protocol is the underlying infrastructure, right? It's a layer one. However, there's no layer zero for Neo Protocol. But in the case of Pith, it's a dApp. So is it built on a layer two? No, it's actually built on a layer one, which is Solana. So we'll assess Solana and of course Neo Protocol in this case as well. So let's touch on the developers as a whole first. Now it's important we assess this, which is developerreports.com. By the way, you guys want to use a website, I'll leave the links to all these websites down below to help you in your journey. But the reason we assess this is not for looking at the altcoins, but it's to assess the overall market. If the overall market is losing developers and our project's gaining or vice versa, if the overall market's gaining and ours is losing, you know, either way, uh, then we can know if ours is going against the grain, it's a good thing, unless of course the market's going up and ours is going down. So again, very important to assess. Now, near protocol, the last year, this is tokenterminal.com, by the way. Again, leave the link down below for you. This is a very good tool, by the way. Uh, near protocol's core developers here are dropping, right? They dropped about 40% recently, even though the price was going astronomic, right? The price went way, way up if we kind of compare these two metrics. Look at this, the price shot past the developers. Now that immediately is a bit of a warning sign. It definitely is. However, check your news. Near Foundation cuts off staff by 40% despite the boom. So there was a strategic reason behind this. 
And so it wasn't because developers like bad project, we're leaving. So that's the number one thing. I wanted to really point this out for Neo Protocol because you will come across instances like this in your research, okay? Now over here for Pith, of course, again, we look at the underlying infrastructure. Pith's adapts, so we look at its next underlying infrastructure, which of course is the layer one. So we look at Solana in this case. Now Solana developers, as you can see here over the last 12 months, have been basically moving steady. Yes, down a little bit, but more or less moving steady. These things come and go basically from the open to the current close. It's more or less the exact same. And if you remember, it's important to check the developer report because over the last just even three months, we've had a massive uh, loss in overall developers from the crypto ecosystem. So Solana is fighting that. Yes, it slightly has succumbed to a little bit of the pressure, but for the most part, it has survived quite well. So this is a really good sign to see. Now, the underlying infrastructure for Pith is great, right? Near protocol, same thing. It's strong. There was a reason why we had the drop off in developers. If we had a sudden drop off and there was no inherent reason, like no news, no layoffs, then that's again, a little bit worrying. Why is the underlying foundation? Why is the economy suffering? Okay. And it might be because, hey, you know, Solana or you know, whatever it might be, Avalanche, Ethereum, that is a bad ecosystem. I'm just throwing names out there for you guys. But again, assess that. Now, when it comes to, for example, a layer one or the foundation, if you want to buy Polkadot, for example, then a drop off in that is even worse because that is your project you're investing in. You know, sometimes dApps can just migrate to different networks. So in the case of Pith, we've checked Solana, but I think it's pretty important as well. We, we do assess the actual ecosystem of Pith. Now, the actual ecosystem in this case is the, uh, the users, right? Who's using the network or who are the consumers? And we can see here, there's a very, very, you guys can't see my sliding bar, but there is a very long list of people using the network. And this is people using it. Again, we have a whole other side of the ecosystem, which is the data providers, which are providing the data, which is over 90. So again, very strong ecosystem for Pith Network, considering again, it's not a new project, it's a couple of years old, but in terms of having a token and an incentive for people to buy the token, it's like what, three months old. So it's very new. It's a very good sign to see. Now our next important task is to assess whether people actually give a crap about the project at all. And it's interesting because I used to talk about socials, which is the next topic here, a lot when I first got into YouTube and I got a lot of criticism, right? I didn't really know how to handle it back then, but I can tell you for sure right now, socials is a massive part of a project. And the reason being is because when you look at a project socials, right? And we'll check a more important stat. Don't ever look at a following count as the be all and end all. That can be artificially pumped with bots airdrops, the list goes on, right? Don't look at this, it's engagements, right? But uh, the reason why it's important is because when a project gains a substantial community, it's gaining what are called evangelists, people who love the project, people who are, you could say like maxis, right? People who love it that much, they'll do anything to support it. And in crypto, it's usually incentivized or pushed by their monetary gain. But nevertheless, we're looking for a project that's gonna have a lot of evangelists because what they do is provide 24 seven free marketing. There's so many small projects out there that I get constantly messaged and tagged in. I've never even heard of them before. And they constantly tag me because again, they're very strong evangelists in those projects, right? It's just constant free marketing. Eventually, you're gonna get people talking more about it, okay? So we are looking for these kinds of people. Now, we have a few couple interesting tools we can leverage. First of all, Twitter is a no brainer. You can come to Twitter and just have a look at, again, gauge the followers, but what you're really looking for is engagement because we want to know if people are actually interested in it and the followers, again, can be, you know, botted or whatever. So we can look at the number of views, but always number of views, and I love this metric, by the way, number of views in combination or contrast with the likes, retweets, and comments. I think these are called reposts now, right? So look at all those three things, but in relation to the view count, okay? So you can see 54,000 views, 200 likes. Over time, I know it might sound silly, over time, you will get a little bit more accustomed to, okay, this is a very bad ratio. There's a little bit of engagement and a lot of views, or, you know, there's a lot, you know, a lot of views and a lot of engagement or vice versa, okay? You can begin to figure out there is no like perfect ratio. This as an example over here, this you know, near protocol reposted this, so it's not actually theirs, but this would be a, an indication of bad engagement. 27,000 views, yet 50 likes, not even 50 likes, five comments. And at that, you can go, of course, and have a look at the comments, but a little cheat sheet here is using Lunar Crush. Now, I wanna say this for the record, Lunar Crush is really pissing me off right now because they had such a very complicated and really robust bunch of uh, metrics we could use and they've dwindled them all down now, right? So I wanna point you guys over to the next best thing we have here, and this is the interactions, aka the engagement over the last 24 hours. 
Ideally, any metric, I like to pull it out for at least 12 months to get an idea of a trend, but we can't really for this case, right? So we can have a look at the last 24 hours. Now, 7 million interactions on all platforms. We can have a look at which platforms it was on, mainly X. Now, if we had a substantial amount on, for example, Telegram or Discord or even Reddit, YouTube, you want to go and have a look at those sources as well. Why do we have a large amount of Reddit uh, interactions or, you know, Telegram or, or Discord? Have a look at those and also assess the overall sentiment regarding the project, right? What is everyone thinking about the project on the socials? That is important because if we'll see in a second here with Pith, okay, the sentiment is overly, now yellow is neutral, by the way, is overly negative, which is red, ever so slightly red, that's bad. People aren't really keen on the project. Again, we don't want to lose evangelists. We want to gain those core committed people. Now, Pith, again, a lot less followers over here than the likes of Neo Protocol. So again, we assess things like the view count, the likes, that's actually a pretty decent ratio. Uh, for example, I've got a, a Twitter post that's got like 200,000 uh, views with like a thousand likes. So that's actually a decent ratio uh, over here. This is actually a decent ratio itself, but you can see like if we aren't, if we're posting frequently and even if the ratios are in check, like this one here is, if they aren't getting a lot of views, a lot of traction themselves, then that is a little bit of a worrying sign. But nevertheless, that's of course, why we have a Luna Crush over here, 24 seven uh, interactions. Now, this is quite low, but as you can see, it is up. So it's good to see it up. However, of course, uh, you know, Pith Network is a considerably smaller project versus Near Protocol. I think Near Protocol is like number seven on the, on the rankings in terms of engagements or interactions, as they say it. So assess the, assess the socials in whatever way possible. Again, you want to come across these different platforms and just see where they're getting the interactions from as well. And the last thing is actually three things, but they're kind of going to blur together. We're going to look at the new accounts versus the active accounts TVL and this total staked as well as the top 100 holders. Now, there was another metric I really wanted to add in here, which was basically looking at who's holding for the longer term, right? If we're having people hold for like, you know, 100, you know, 200 days, that's a good sign to see, but there's no real like one place we can look for that kind of metric. So this is what I've used in the past and this is good enough, but I wanted to throw it out there. Like if you can find a, a website, any sort of platform that you're using uh, is able to track and how many tokens they hold per person, that is a very valuable insight, especially if you can draw it out in the long time frame. So over here for Near Protocol, again, we want to assess active users or daily new accounts, basically versus the whole total pot. And as you can see, this is insane, right? We can see here daily increases of 1 million wallets uh, per day. And the total wallets for Near Protocol right now has surged to 18 million. Now, again, guys, back over here, right? Like six months ago, it was half of that. So growing very, very fast. This is a good sign to see. But Pith Network, it's a little bit different, right? It's it definitely up, right? Definitely spawned, again, not too long ago, a few months ago. And already it's at 130,000 holders. Active holders are about 1,800 people. But again, this is just simply from SolScan. This doesn't take into consideration, you know, centralized wallets. So I want to make that very apparent as well. So this isn't too bad. I wouldn't rank this a bad score. Uh, you want to look, if it's a bad score, you're looking at something declining, right? You're looking at holders dropping or staying stagnant. Uh, for example, uh, Moonbeam is a prime example of this. If you guys have a look at Moonbeam's chart, this is what I would call, I wouldn't say bad, but this is like borderline, like average to bad, okay? You can see here daily increase of uh, wallets is about 17, 13,000, whatever it might be fluctuates. Over wallets is about 19, 20 million, which is actually pretty good for a project. Like that's actually good, but the daily increase has really slowed down. Traction's, traction, fundamentally speaking, has paused at least for moonbeam but we again can't just like leave it there we do have to assess things like tvl and total stake so the tvl is important that's total value locked and we can come to DeFi llama on this one but the thing is DeFi is technically speaking just tvl right stable coins you know protocols relating to the ecosystem in DeFi, and for near protocol it's 94 million which isn't amazing i won't lie to you it's not amazing at all we can also assess though aurora which is one of like the main uh, evm compatible chains on near protocol that, that helps boost it up but the other thing you have to assess here as well is the total staked in the network total stake for validators okay because again tbl only really associates to the ecosystem whereas total staked is how much people bond to validators in this case quite a lot 571 million near protocol tokens staked which to give you some idea is roughly speaking about half of the current well actually over half of the current circulating supply so that is fantastic to see over here for the oracles it's a bit different okay for oracles pith works on total value secured not total value locked because it has no ecosystem it's looking at securing 
data points, right? Transactions going through supported by, you know, values. So in this case, uh, Chainlinks are number one, Pith is number two, but not by TVS, uh, Total Value Secured, by Protocol Secured, okay? So Total Protocol Secured Chainlink is more or less just over double, uh, whereas a TVS for Chainlink is like whatever that is, like 10 times more basically. So you want to assess these things as well. Like Pith, fundamentally speaking, is like the second best, I believe, uh, project right behind, of course, Chainlink. And it's different because it's on Solana. So you got Ethereum versus Solana, but Pith is known to be on more networks than Chainlink, which is again, going back into the meme. So this is quite good. 2 billion total value secured is very good for again, a network that we only recently had its token officially launched. And last, of course, we checked the top 100 holders. Now, why this is important is because we're looking for a decentralized network. We're looking for a network that doesn't have all of the whales holding the tokens because they're going to be more incentivized to dump at even cheaper prices, leaving us hoping for a price 2x more. It never comes because the whales bloody sold their tokens off when they were in a you know, substantial profit, basically. So we can come to a website here called CoinCarp. I tend to use these guys quite a lot, but as we'll see in a second, I do suggest you vet some of the information on any website that is, of course, apart from the horse's mouth. So Near Protocol over here has the top 100 holders at 51%. So there's 51% of the supply in the top 100 holders, which is actually a very good sign to see. The lowest I think I've seen so far is like Cardano at like 30%. Near Protocol is great. I think 50% is the benchmark. Um, anything more is a little bit kind of like moving away from average to bad. Anything I think below 40% is borderlining average to good. So Nia is right in the middle of it all, which is fantastic. However, the same cannot be said for Pith Network. So these guys have again, 127,000 holders. We've assessed that. But the top 100 holders is 94% of the token supply, which is very, very bad. The only way it could be worse, it was 100%, basically, in my opinion, right? So it's like borderlining very, very bad. Again, we just want to come over here because that's horrible. Uh, if it's too horrible or too good, I would say like if it's just, if it's uh, too good to be true or too bad to be true, come over and have a look at the Ether scan. So in this case, we can use Sol scan, which is Solana scan. Uh, and we can see here 16%, 13%, 8%, 6%, 5%. If you just add up like the top 10, top 20 wallets to get a rough idea, you don't have to go the whole nine yards to the whole top 100 you will get a pretty good idea of how much is being held in those top wallets. And of course, if you add these up, it looks like it most definitely is true. So that is not good. You do want to check though who these accounts are. Sometimes these accounts, especially if they hold like a nice even quantity, are specifically accounts for, you know, liquidity pools and things like that. So you just want to make sure that it isn't actually in the hands of real whales. And in this case with Pith, they aren't, right? So that's a good thing. But you do want to assess this, first of all. You just want to come over here and just make sure that, hey, the top 100 holders are bad, but who are we talking about here? That's the distribution, right? So, guys, with that being said, look, th these are the four things, technically four things, I would look out for the most. Again, meme number one, and it goes right through, but they all work hand in hand. They help give you the bigger picture, and without the big picture, you're really just investing blindly, okay? You can look at one thing, you can single out, hey, Pith has, let's just say, you know, minus the, the exchanges and things like that, liquidity pools, Let's say it's, you know, 80% in the top 100. Oh, that's so bad. I don't, I don't want to invest in Pith, but you're leaving out all this amazing stuff, you know, hence why you end up, you know, never buying in and then going to yourself, oh, I wish I just bought in. Why did it pump? So assess these things. This will provide a very good framework and I really do, do hope it helps you out in 2024 and 2025. So guys, thanks so much. If you've made it this far, hit the like button and I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Take good care. Bye.